Hello again and welcome. Thank you very much for tuning in. This is episode 14 of the Guitar Souls. Today, myself, Mike from Party Cannon, and my handsome friend, Levi Clay. I'm glad for... you remembered that it's episode 14. I had no idea. <laughs> well, there we go. As if I'm the most prepared one. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, episode 14. For those of you that are still listening, thanks very much. We do appreciate all the support, the suggestions, the comments, everything that shares, the lot. Please keep it up. Tell us what you want to see and we'll keep going. Um, today we have quite a few things to go over. Uh, before we go into that, I just want to apologise that there's been a bit of a, a, a hiatus again as well. Just quite a lot going on in personal life. So we'll try and keep content coming as much as possible. And for those of you who were disappointed, which is no one... Don't worry, uh, I've flogged him. It's a... <laughs> oh, that was quite good. I enjoyed it. Yeah. So those of you that are watching will notice I have a lot less beard than Levi these days. Um, I had a mishap with my clippers. I'll just tell you a funny story before that. I went to uh, fix my sideburns and in the process despite the fact that I had the longest guard on lost most of my facial hair in one go and then I got halfway through my beard and the battery died and it's not one that takes like normal batteries you have to recharge it and I couldn't find the charger so I spent about three hours switching it on and off after letting it just kind of get a wee bit more battery and just going bit uh, by bit yeah. nah, it was like a fucking nightmare my anyway only, sorry my only takeaway from that was I wish I had the longest card on but unfortunately I don't so Hmm, beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Ah, so, <laughs> Jesus so what, Christ. What are we talking about today? Today we are going to talk about something we've not covered just yet, which is Gibson. Never, Never heard spoke of him. about him. No, I mean, we, we need to get everybody up to date with us so they understand who we're talking about yeah. and what the topic is. So, yeah, first of all, we're going to talk about Gibson and Henry Juskiewicz. Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah, let's go with that. Henry, the CEO, soon to be ex CEO as I'm sure some of you found out. Um, we're going to talk about Billy Corgan and his feuds with the companies he had previously endorsements with. Uh, Brent Hines in some degree almost the same thing, but talking about him losing quite a lot of his gear. Um, into Devon Townsend, uh, uh, quite a hilarious internet battle between religious fundamentalists and Travis Ryan from Cattle Decapitation. Yes! No, no, it's right up Levi Street, man. It's yeah. an argument and it's against fucking brainwashed religion yeah like, and I don't mean that against just religion in general but people who take it to the extreme yeah. who just do not see any common sense yeah. those of you with faith please don't be offended you are relative to your own faith uh, uh, we're going to talk about titties we all fucking love titties love titties just, just you wait for it and then we'll have the album club yeah um, yeah Look, looks good I'm alright with that and uh, we're, doing, we're doing a doubler today aren't we because you are you are out on tour what, is it a tour would you consider it's not a tour because you no it's a one off but we're playing at Death Feast Open Air in Germany this weekend but yeah you're away for how long we get the ferry on Thursday uh, I'll be at the festival Friday Saturday it, does, it starts on Thursday I wish I could go early but I'm going to miss the first day um, but we'll be there Friday we play on Saturday and then we get the ferry home on Sunday and I'll be home midday sometime Monday and are there any bands that are playing that are worth listening to? And don't say Party Cannon. You know I don't fall for that shit. That, that, I wouldn't ever say that. Um, there's actually too many to list. I mean, the, the, the two main headliners that I'm most excited to see are Mizzet Index and Dying Fetus, who I've played with before. Uh, pff, just go and check the lineup. up. It's fucking outrageous. The festival itself looks like it's going to be an absolute nailer. And I've not played many Oatmere festivals. I think I've played one, if memory serves correctly, which was Flesh Party Open Air in Slovakia. That's exactly where it was. Um, which was fantastic. Death Feast looks like it's going to be unbelievable. Go have a look. Um, just Death Feast Open Air 2018 into Google and you'll see the lineup. And it is fucking silly. So yeah. I'm looking forward to that. So man. there's some positivity. Oh, yeah. Why don't we do some negativity? Why not? Gibson. Have you heard of them? <laughs> no, not once. <laughs> you never mentioned them before. I know, I know. It's it's weird, like all these um, months on, still having a B in. I d is it just faux outrage at this point? Because I, d I really don't care for, for uh, them. I, I think it's... Can you be angry and apathetic at the same time? Because uh, it's like... It, yeah. It's like, you know they're going down the shitter, but you're still angry about it, but you don't care enough to try and do anything about it because you know it's like, the, the, that ship is sinking, that is fucked, but... What a waste of a historic, almost like fucking house, household name brand. Yep. As we were speaking about before. What a fucking joke. Anyway, they as it turns out. Posting ads for yeah. a new CEO. Yeah. Through Levi's sources somehow, we managed to get a look at the advert. 
Oh, oh everyone's got those links. Now. Oh, okay, I, I was fair yeah, enough. No, I managed to. I find it, you know, back sourcing via news story. So, oh, yeah. okay, fair enough. Got the the original um, post. Uh, yeah, on the on the actual website that it was posted on, they didn't mention the Gibson name. So they're obviously advertising for a CEO mm -hmm. for a an unnamed company, and you had to inquire about the job to find out who the uh, company was. And obviously, more diligent journalists did that. Um, we're reporting on this like twelve days after it, it, yeah. it leaked. So um, <laughs> yeah. you you all probably know this, but um, yeah, I I really don't know what to take from this. I'm glad that they're moving in the right direction. Shame that it's taken them this long to to get there. Should have should have done this years ago. To be fair, so mm -hmm. yeah, I bet. Well, the sad thing is, I bet he's having a shitty time with it. But also, I bet he's not because he would have got a massive, massive payoff, won't he? He's not going to be poor from it. That is one certainty. Henry, jump before your pushkiewicz. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's done all right. Um, yeah. it's, it's a shame that we have to talk about this person so negatively when we don't know if there's maybe things he's done behind the scene that have been basically damage control rather than fuck it, it's, it's gone and we, we can only go by what we see in the public light and we don't know if the company's maybe hiding things that they're doing or Henry's doing or whatever so if he is doing good, if, if you're, I doubt you're listening but <laughs> apologies for offending you but it doesn't look good on the outside we and don't, we don't apologise for offence here yeah, fuck you, <laughs> fuck you now um, again but on the Gibson note, we can talk about uh, Billy Corgan, who recently, uh, well, actually 19 days ago. Um, Recent? <laughs> yeah, uh, I guess. Uh, well, not in, in 2018 when you've got this constant barrage of fake news. Sorry about that, Henry. Um, constant barrage of fake news. You keep keep talking. Yeah. Two hours later. Well, that was fun. Probably should have turned my doorbell off. Uh, fucking door i've fucking got like dogs. living doorbells as well like any and you know someone knocks at the door dogs go mental someone knocks your neighbor's door dogs go yeah. mental someone, someone as your neighbor dogs go mental someone, someone lives in the same street dogs go mental walks past house dogs go, go mental. mental yep it's um someone yeah. breathes too loud dogs go mental. <laughs> they ruin virtually every single one of my youtube videos so i'm just kind of used to it now augment but, um, they yeah, don't augmented. ruin they're beautiful they augment when i bring them on and i show them off but uh yeah it's like, yeah, it's like gearing with jack isn't it yeah <laughs> Um, okay, cool. So we were talking about Billy Corgan and yes. having um, public spats. We're not. So this wasn't. This was actually in an Instagram Q and A, I believe. Yeah, in an Instagram Q and A, someone asked him about his relationship with Fender and would you go back to working with Fender? And he said, "Never. They disrespected me, and I would never go back." Which is crazy when you think like, if I ever thought of Billy Corgan and thought of musical equipment, I think of that strat with the three hot rails, like that is. Or I think it's Demarzi was, but you know what I mean. Like that is what I think of as a Billy Corgan signature. Um, I don't really think of anything when it comes to Billy Corgan. That's your loss. A few songs when I was like fourteen, and none of them grabbed me. Yeah. Despite all his rage, he is still around a cage. Yeah, that's yeah, that's me. Um, yeah. So, uh, that one. <laughs> but so when asked to elaborate on that, he said that it was kind of too petty to get into. Which I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that. Like if you're gonna have, if you're gonna have issues, have issues. Don't hint at issues. It's that lying and implying thing. That I'm not saying that he's lying, but it's the it's the implication. It could be a tiny, tiny little thing. Mm -hmm. Like he had a signature model. They wanted to give him five percent of sales. He wanted five point five percent of sales, um, and they couldn't could agree over that. There's, you know, don't don't imply. But he does go on to say, um, you know, the prospect of Gibson working with Gibson. And Billy came back with Gibson also blew me off, so I'll play them, but I won't work with them. But I do want them to survive. So, yeah, kind of nice. What do you think about stuff like this? Artists having issues with uh, with brand that they're working with. I don't think that's necessarily something that is uncommon. And I think the whole point in that relationship is to work towards a compromise. Like, surely that would be the same as anything in life. You want things to go well. But you also don't want to be misrepresented. You don't want something that has your name on it and therefore you as a brand to be either not true, not what you want, or not of the quality that you want to represent. Yep. I mean, that might just be me looking at it as just directly the idea of an endorsement or having a signature model or whatever, but it, it should all be about compromise. Like I, 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 I understand people getting pissy and making it public, but it's best when it's not. Yeah, it's kind of both. I think it's you're right. It's best from a business perspective when it's not, but we love a bit of gossip. I will. <laughs> Otherwise, this podcast wouldn't exist. Yeah, yeah. 
So yeah. So when you're I right. look at that, right. um, you know, this t- just talking about it in general, and then saying that it's too petty to get into. Like you, you're already stoking the fires. It was a, it was an offhand comment that has been enough for news outlets to turn into a story. So um, you know, why not give people a, a bit more juice? But the thing I really took from this is, um, what did he say? He said that they disrespected him. And what does that mean in this day and age? And no disrespect to Billy Corgan, because it, I mean, it, ironically, me saying no, no disrespect, but the majority of stories about him as a person are fucking mental. Yeah. Oh man, like he owns a tea room that he live streamed him playing ten hours of crazy synth stuff, and it was meant to be a like I'm pretty sure it was supposed to be like some sort of musical interpretation of a book. He's, he's fucking mental. Like, he's mental, but, like, in a good way. He's obviously got cool stories. Yeah. Um, I think he was recently on Joe Rogan's podcast as well. Okay. Um, and I'm sure there's a couple of weird stories came for that, if if memory serves correctly, and it wasn't that long ago. I'll have a look for it. Um, but, aye, when, when it comes to Billy Corgan, I, um, he seems humble, but he also seems as if he's got a lot of fucking weird shit happened to him that he could probably talk about and cast up, so nothing's really out of the realm for him. Unless this is like a weird urban legend, I've been fucking conjuring. No, I, I believe it. Like that, you can speculate one or the other way. It doesn't really matter. Ultimately, yeah. the, he's an artist. Yeah, you know? um, definitely. And what can often come with that is believing your own hype. Like yeah, we we have no idea what they disrespected me means. No, and it could. It when you say something like that, you're you're giving all of your fans and listeners a negative opinion of Fender, but without giving them that information of exactly how they would disrespected you. Yeah. So you can come to the conclusion um, of whether or not you've mm-hmm. actually been disrespected or you're an egomaniac. Yeah, is, um, it could be the difference between we're dropping your signature model because it's not popular enough, it doesn't have the right sales, and you could take that as being disrespectful, or... Billy has contacted Fender and said, I want to be at NAM and I want to be doing performances, showing up all these instruments. And they go, well, no, we've got all these other guys already booked. And then that being the case and any other myriad of fucking ex- or reasons or excuses or scenarios that could have come up. So you're right. I get what you mean. It's so ambiguous. It's, it's quite unfair. Uh, this is where I'm going to reach out to our listeners and say I, I'd, I'd be interested in doing more on stuff like this. So if you listeners can think of any examples of artists having public, and I mean public, spats with companies that they worked with, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I'd be interested in you reaching out to us, letting us know in the comment section of this video or on SoundCloud or wherever you happen to be listening uh, on our Facebook page. Mm-hmm. You know, Just uh, remind us of, of artists that we might have forgotten about because I think it's always always fun to... To hear, I the thing for me uh, that fascinates me is the uh, mental gymnastics that artists go through when they go from one brand to another. It's like artist A played these guitars and then they move on to another company. Mm-hmm. Um, but while they were with the first company, they you know sang the praises of the guitars. But now they've moved on to another company and they need to sing the praises of these guitars. But what does do, that mean? They necessarily need to talk negatively of the last ones. Yeah, or? and and eat, like. After you've been with five or six companies, different guitar companies, what is your word really worth anymore? Oh yeah, yeah. I absolutely love these guitars. These guitars are great. You said that about five or six other companies. Yeah. Like this is, I mean, I love the guy, but that just as soon as you were talking about that, all I could conjure up was Dave Mustaine. Played uh, Jacksons for years and years and years. Yeah. Then moved to ESP. Then moved to Dean, and I don't even know who else he's with now. Well, I'm, I, I, I was thinking Greg Howe. <laughs> I don't know too much about Greg House signatures, yeah. to be fair. He's so. with Kiesel now, so... Oh, okay. Fair yeah, enough, fair enough. He's been through a fair amount of companies over... The, there yeah, was... that, yeah, in fact, that's right enough, because it, it was a Calvin player originally, correct? I'm trying to think what he played like. I'm sure he played Calvin's, and then he, was in, he had an ESP. Well, I think of him, like, his early days, he had the... Uh, the heavy metal strats, the Fender heavy metal strats. Okay. Um, he's been Which with are VSP. Cool fucking guitars. Yeah, very cool guitars. He's been with VSP. He also has. Cool uh, I'm sure he's had some Ibanez stuff. I remember his. Uh, he had a card that was covered in Joker cards. I'm sure that was Ibanez. I could be wrong on that. I mm-hmm. can see the guitar, but I can't picture who made the damn thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was with Sir for a while. Then he went off with Laguna, which, uh, if memory serves correct, were uh, Guitar Center's own brand of guitars. Uh, yeah, and he had his own signature model of those. They had quality control issues, and yeah, um, and now he's with Kiesel. So um, you know, who knows where he'll be next year? TTM, <laughs> Pro- probably. <laughs> he can get a free guitar if you go with those guys. <laughs> no, no, I need to redact that and take it yeah, off. Yeah. Get rid of it. 
Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, let's continue. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> yeah, let, let, let's carry on with these artists things though. So on the last episode, we talked about um, both Mastodon. Yep. And Devon Townsend. I think yep. it was the last episode, maybe the episode before. No, that's right. We were but talking about them losing money, losing money on tours. Mm -hmm. um, and we also talked about you know Misha and the guys from Periphery and how they are very forward thinking and yeah. they have lots of um, avenues to make money. Um, and I think this has come full circle now because we, both Brent Hines and Devon Townsend have come up with some additional ways to make some revenue yes. for themselves. Yeah, which um, is a one seems to be quite a good sustainable one, and the other one's quite interesting. Of the conversations we are the things he was talking about that we spoke about as well yep. in his relationships with other companies. Obviously, Brent has decided that Gibson can go fuck themselves and no other unpolite way but uh, basically Brent's in selling off a lot of his own personal collection of guitars amps keyboards fucking the lot he's even selling a pedal steel which is cool it, yeah. uh, it seems it, it seems very eclectic when it comes to music stuff which is yeah. cool I, I do actually really like Mastodon I think Crack the Sky is one of like one of the greatest kind of proggy rock albums that I've heard of the last 10-15 years yep and they always have great music videos music videos are fucking crazy yeah so, um, yeah, we can't give too much info on this because there's no prices posted yet. Nothing. Um, and the store doesn't go live until the 23rd, which is two days from now. Uh, you need to leave your email on the uh, Reverb page to get the information when things go live. Mm -hmm. um, but they've shown a few things off that are being sold. You know, a 1981 Gibson Flying V, uh, a 2008 67 reissue V. There's a first act custom shop Lola Double Neck, which uh, is a 12 and 6 string, I believe. Looks like a Schecter. Um, also selling off PRS um, S2. Cool. It's quite Pedal nice, steel. actually. It's interesting. Yeah. It looks like the is it Gibson S1. You know what I want about? No. It's a weird big fuck off Les Paul with three weird rail pickups. Like see through, a big copper block on. Them. Another one of those things that Gibson made to desperately try and chase some sales oh it's, it's a horrendous looking guitar that looks like a nice version yeah. of it that's just my opinion uh, but in the video they're showing clips off of you know Marshall amps and uh, I saw somewhere that somebody mentioned an explorer that he was selling um, though I couldn't find anything other than people's comments top one? so that could have just been featured in, in you know background mm -hmm. footage in the video and yeah. then they've just gone with oh he must be selling that but yeah um, yeah they're really like for a collector very interesting someone who's interested in just buying some nice equipment very interesting. People who are interested in the band are going to look into that. Yeah. And general gearheads are going to be quite into that. But I don't think this is a great revenue stream for them. If this is I'm just clearing house, that's fair enough. Yeah, that's what he said it was. You know, I'm a collector. I've got loads and yeah. loads of stuff. I just collect. I've got so much space filled with stuff that I don't really need. I'd like to get rid of some of it so I can put more stuff there. I can respect that. That's... Yeah, that's fair enough. Like, at the end of the day, it's his stuff. It's his... Uh, this has fucking choice do what he wants but here's where we can have some fun here's where we can speculate right mm -hmm. what are they going to sell for so first of all is this going to be auction or is it going to be a store read on it yet did you not say the store opens it says the store opens but that very well could be you know here are the items place your bids with it being reverb there's going to be a price and you can obviously make offers around about that so yeah. it won't, I don't think it'll be an auction does reverb do auctions well, I mean does reverb uh, pre-announced that they've got a store opening like they're doing new things that's true it's quite a big one yeah but I think that's probably because it's a, an artist selling quite a lot of their own personal collection as one rather than it being right. like a retail shop or whatever yeah um, but yeah quite an interesting one but then here is the, the more interesting thing to speculate on mm -hmm. how much value do you think Brent Hines and Reverb are attributing to the fact that these belonged to Brent Hines do you think that considering the, the full story is about him being in the band the, some of the equipment how it's been on like every album except this one and that one and all these other weird things and quite a lot clearly you and think that's going to boost value to people I think that's the way they're going to sell it I don't think it necessarily changes the value but you've seen it yourself you get people who sell guitars and it says artist owned next to it like it's only going to add value to someone who thinks that adds value yes it's the same as when you get eBay and people write rare one of a kind look unusual model can I do a rant can I do a rant yes please you know what fucks me off more than anything else in the world probably not more than anything else in the world everything YouTube videos where in the title they put rare rare footage what do you mean fucking rare how is this rare it's on YouTube it's easily accessible by anyone in the fucking world anybody can watch this it's been distributed to hundreds of thousands if not millions of people yep. it's not rare 
Sorry, I, I, just... I thought it was good. I liked it, but I totally get your point. It's a, it's on demand. That is the exact opposite of rare. Yeah. You can access it any time. Yeah. Put in brackets, previously rare. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Once so rare, the... no common. Yeah, you said the word rare and it just popped into my mind. <laughs> Fuck me, hi. That, um, that, that was my pet hate with eBay when I was younger. It was rare, look with two O's instead of fucking zeros instead of O's like why fucking yeah. stop it anyway yep uh, the reason I bring this up is because I remember it was it was probably like three or four years before I really started getting into him but Paul Gilbert sold off a bunch of his uh, private gear so I think he sold off his PGM 30 the one that was converted from being the floating trim to the hardtail mm-hmm. they had the block in it and quite a few other weird maybe he sold Japanese off his only ones as well a hell of a lot of cool stuff but back in the Racer X days he um he was playing a, a pink BC Rich mm. Mockingbird, right? Uh, with X's on the uh, for fretboard inlays, right? Um, super cool. Uh, he sold that and uh, Mister Mutley, an old Racer X Forum member, member, member. I'm not, I'm not going to name him personally, um, but yeah, you know, I keep up to date with what he's doing. Um, he owns that now, and I think if memory serves me correct, he paid eight hundred pounds for it. So the point I'm getting at, it could have even been less than that. The point I'm getting at is when Paul Gilbert decided I need to clear house, I need to sell a bunch of gear. I'm going to sell it to my fans. He didn't go, I'm Paul Gilbert, therefore these things are worth five times more than if you were buying them on the mm-hmm. second-hand market. Mm-hmm. It was, he was super cool about it. Like, this is a guitar. Mm-hmm. It's probably worth about this. What do you think? But uh, You know, I think reverb and the used instrument market is going to stop that happening in this instance as well. You might still get the artist owned and maybe like an extra $100, $200, but... You- I really think, like, I don't know what a, a 2008 67 Gibson Flying V reissue sells for. Secondhand, maybe £1,200. To- total guess. Total fucking yeah. guess. Let's see, in the perfect scenario, it's 1200 quid on the dollar. Let's say whatever the average market value for a secondhand guitar is, I reckon these are going to be for sale for three times the price of that. We'll need to see. That'll be a good one to so, put back on. Yeah, there's me speculating. But I would like to think not, personally, given the the marketplace they've chosen. Yeah. Reverb is literally like you and I's heaven to go on and go, nah, there's people selling these for much less. There's previous sales for these amounts and that amount. Therefore, this is fair because of condition. Fucking they even track quality, that stuff. Blah, blah, blah. You can see like previous sales of any yeah. particular model or something and get a rough idea of what it's worth. So, um, you know, I like that. But in the same instance, we did have a reverb fucking advert when we we're talking about the Dumble cable which was for silly money, so, ah, uh, yeah, it can go either way. <laughs> I, either way, whatever happens, happens, and we'll, we'll talk about it. I've got a great it. idea. Oh. Maybe Brent Hines will be the first feature on Chances Answers. <laughs> More on that coming soon. <laughs> yeah, we'll talk about that once it's in full, full conception. But cool, so also, idea. Devin Townsend. Yes, yeah, so Devin, much the same as Brent Hines, is also looking at revenue streams, and we're speaking about, as was in the last episode, Mastodon talking about not making money on tours and Devin saying they toured for almost a full year and they don't know if they even broke even. Devin has released a free book. Levi got really pissy and said, well, actually, it's an e-book. It's not a book. It's not a physical copy. Anyway, Devin has uh, put out this free content for people who are interested called How to Develop Creativity and Excel as a Successful Independent Songwriter in a Changing Industry. I mean, that's a fucking mouthful. But it'll be interesting because... It's free. Yeah, I mean, on top of that though, like you think about, if Devin's worried about or saying that he maybe didn't make money, but you see the amount of preparation and devotion that goes into like the live shows and yeah. the writing and the recording, like, you know this man's talking about it basically from passion, Yeah, and the business side of it just comes as part of that. We got some cool. real interesting kickback on on that Devon Townsend thing. No, well, not not no one, but a fair few people had zero sympathy for Devon Townsend. They were like, "Yeah, but it's his fault. He doesn't make money because he has such spectacular shows." What do you mean? What are you saying? Are how, you saying how else that, do you pull people in? Yeah, are you saying that what he should do is give his fans less? Uh, uh, that's crazy, isn't it? It's like, I mean. I don't even know how to wrap my head around I that. Like, I, I just don't get it. Why would you ever be upset that someone wants to put on a massive, enjoyable, interactive performance for you? Yeah. Someone that's music is so diverse and like emotionally charged and meant to be like, I don't know if cathartic is the right word for it, but like, it's there. Like, fuck. Now I'm crazy people. I've not actually downloaded the book yet. Mm-hmm. Um, I probably should, but. Being the uh, being the cynic that I am, mm-hmm. and knowing how marketing on the internet works, 
Um, you know, all you got to put in is your name and your email address because your email address and your name are valuable to people. Um, Devin wants your email address mm -hmm. so he can send you this book. And hmm, he also, though, has a course available that you can sign up to. Uh, and that is, for some reason, I can't click it. There we go. Yeah, this is on uh, the Music Business College, Devon Townsend's Creative Academy. So I get the distinct impression that the book is probably like a, a extremely stripped down version of this, and it will probably make mention of this several times. It's a free mm -hmm. advert for, for this course. Uh, potentially. I haven't read it either, so I don't yeah. want to speculate, but you could be right. However, and I know I constantly defend Devon because I fucking think he's incredible. I love it. In the past, he's offered free content. He's put plenty of stuff on his YouTube. I, I'm actually pretty sure his YouTube name is Poopy Nuggeteer. I know, he's fucking mental. So in between the mad content of him like walking about and making crazy faces, there used to be things he did that was like, I think he called it Pro Tools Academy. Right. And basically he would open a file of whatever song he thought people would want to see the most and show you how he layered it. What he did to the vocals to make them sound extra crisp and weird. His little tricks. Yep. That's public access. That's all free so i don't think it's necessarily that the book's going to be just to advertise this i think it's going to be a strip back but not an advert you know the answer to this right um but we'll give the audience a, a chance to speculate mm -hmm. um this online course isn't cheap so we're talking about someone that has a history, in your own words, of giving stuff away for free. And he's giving away a book for free. But if you would like to sign up to this course, which I believe contains eight lectures, eight lectures from Devon Townsend, um, it comes in at the, the whopping price. It's actually $596, but if you pay in full, you can get it for $497. Um, so 500 bucks for this. I think that's probably a bit on the steep side. Without seeing the course, I don't know how I'd feel, but given the competition that it has online, Ultimate Recording Machine and Nail the Mix and stuff, ah, uh, yes. I mean, I was going to mention those. Those are totally, totally different things. But I pay for my um, URM and Nail the Mix subscription annually. Um, how much are those a year? 300 bucks. Good. So you get, uh, uh, they cost less, sorry, than this. And there's more diverse options but i think the difference is that's offering you something that's like you can pick and choose which artist you like and you can dissect how they go about it and yeah but probably... it's all there if i want it of course yeah like but... lamb of they've got lamb of god on there this month yeah, yeah redneck that's, i've seen that's that awesome that's Is it redneck cool. i've not even checked what the track was um, i just saw it and went awesome yeah i think it's redneck <laughs> um it's, it's just like it's just, that's an astonishing amount of value um or another example might be again it's a it's a different product but groove 3 is another site that i use for um learning how to use recording software um, hmm. plugins and you know just how to effectively use the all the ins and outs and tricks of things uh and i pay for that for i paid an annual subscription for that and it was 100 bucks it's 100 bucks and there's hundreds thousands of videos on there teaching everything you could want so i feel that 500 bucks is probably a bit of a bit high You've gone in a bit high there, I think, Devin. But it's not a good analogy, but the way I kind of see it is like if you nail the mix in URM would be like Netflix. You can dip your toes in and try whatever you want, and mm -hmm. you've got loads of options. Whereas signing up for Devin's course is like buying like a like a box set DVD. Like mm -hmm. you are investing in that, and that's it. It's that content that you want. It's exactly what you're after. So you get the one thing, and you pay a lot more for it. But you also get that like intimately. You know what I mean? Like if if, if you're if, if you just want to know how Devin goes about recording and his creative process, he is quite well known for his wall of sound <laughs> approach and he's very good at producing when he when he does what he wants to do in terms of like dynamic range and just being quite effective with building up crazy layers. He's not going to do any of that there though, is he? This isn't like... It's not like a subscription site to like Martin Taylor's Online Guitar Academy or Jimmy Bruno's Guitar Academy or whatever. This is a, uh, a series of lectures on excelling in the creative industries. Maybe I've misunderstood it then, but up there it looks as if he's talking about recording, recording process, production, production process. I would imagine that stuff's going to take you into it. There's mixing a track. There's definitely okay. parts in there that are going to take you into that. Yeah. No, fair, fair. There does. I mean, there seems like there's a reasonable amount of content here. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, those are all, what, three hours, three five hours, hours long? Three hours. 
No, that's five hours. Um, about an hour and a half. It was a lot. There, there was a lot of content, but um, yeah, it doesn't matter what way you spin it. I just think five hundred. Like, that's still a lot of money. Let me I don't, put it I don't disagree with you. If it was one hundred and fifty bucks, you're going to have ten times the sales. So you would make more money at having this at 150 bucks, I think. Um, but having said that, what do I know? Devin Townsend is extremely successful with the music industry and he probably has a, a better idea of what he's doing than I do. <laughs> what I can say is for that for that price, um, yeah, no, I, I, can't, I can't justify that. I That's fair. Yeah. I think that raises a quite an interesting topic as well, like talking about someone, someone's own perceived value of their knowledge versus what other people's is. Yeah. So I think that's where it's really interesting to look at the market and talk about Neil the Mix and URM and then obviously Devons and whatever other courses there are. For example, Tom Hess, you know, everybody wants that. Not, sorry, you can bleep that out if you want. No comment. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, yeah, there's plenty of other courses on there and it obviously goes by recommendations and your own personal interpretation of what you're going to get from it what the value is to you and what you're going to gain from it yeah yeah it's um what <laughs> what i would say is look, look, at, I, look I'm, just, I'm really carefully choosing these words i love him devon townsend is great but you know what i also just hope cross my fingers and hope that they'll have him on now the mix at some point because yeah. i feel that you're just going to get all of this from from that like again the only, i've been on now the mix uh slash urm ultimate recording machine it's ultimate recording machine unstoppable unstoppable recording machine is it, sorry I'm, it is. I'm sorry my apologies yeah, I've, it's just urm to me and i forget also forget what it stands for but i haven't any, seen up to it so i'm just going by yeah point is like i've been on there a while now and the only month i've been on where the thing has really made me go awesome can't wait for this was the opeth month and i've still not digested all of that content i can um, imagine the live stream was 10 hours like it's a ten-hour fucking live stream mixing that track from scratch. Was that not one of the albums that uh, Stephen Wilson? No, did the mastering on? No. Oh, I don't know if he did the mastering on it. Because I think he done quite a lot of mixing and mastering on a few of the albums, yeah. and also did some keyboard. But that might well be what album is it? It's Watershed, doesn't it? Watershed, yeah. I think it's before that. I'm sure yeah. it was like um, Blackwater Park or something he did. So ten, a, ten hours of of content there. But obviously, I'm really looking forward to seeing how the. Uh, um, the Lamb of God track pans out mm-hmm. uh, that will again probably be a 10 hour live stream in our URM uh, private tutorials thing John Brown just uploaded an 8 hour tutorial on recording guitars not mixing guitars because John's great but I don't think that like when it comes to mixing he's not the best in the world and and he'll be the first to admit that that's why he didn't mix the new Monuments album but he knows how to record like he really knows how to record mm-hmm. 8 solid hours I believe of just every single aspect of recording guitars down to like Kemper's, Axe FX's, digital stuff, different amplifiers. He recorded um, a loop of a, a track and had that play through all of these different amps and they were playing with mic placement and things. And then he was testing and saying which ones he liked, which ones he didn't and why he liked them and why he didn't like them and how they'd work in a mix, how they wouldn't work in a mix. Like it's just an obscene amount of content and you can sign up to that for 20, 20 bucks for the month. Like That's pretty insane. 500 bucks just out the fucking window sorry Devin love you buddy but um, yeah it's just too much for me too rich for my blood and and this is my this is my career like this is what I'd, I spend a lot more money than um, uh, many of my students and friends do on on stuff like this because I can justify it it's like a tax write off like it, it's, for, it's for my business uh, but even 500 500 bones too much for me <laughs> anyway shall I move on do you have a bit of fun what's that cattle decapitation you fucking love this story. I do. It, it, it entertained me, and well, it's it entertains me for two reasons. One, um, well, it interests me for two reasons. One, it means that I get to mention Cattle Decapitation. Who? Uh, what's that? What is that album called? Do you remember what the album's called? Monolith of Inhumanity. Yes. Cool. So I was introduced to that by Doug, um, mm-hmm. who I will have on this YouTube channel. Um, probably this weekend because he's up so i'll do some videos talking with him um he played this to me and it was just a bit much it was a bit heavy and chaotic uh but he said no no, it's cool stick with it um because 15 minutes in maybe less than that it's there's going to be a break of ambience and it's going to be like the biggest breath of fresh air and you're going to really enjoy it and when that happened i was like you know what you're right that's really cool um so yeah i've got time for cattle decapitation um even if 
memory serves me correctly, they uh, they're they're mad vegetarian animal rights activists. Isn't that I, right? I think that was always the rumor. I don't know if they actually are, but it could well be that that's the driving force. They they definitely have a lot of environmentally charged lyrics and themes. It's all about basically how man is the bastard and we are fucking earth and everything for everyone. Which he's not wrong to be fair. The, the band aren't wrong in saying that. So yeah, but I don't know how true the whole okay. incredible, over the top, super vegan, militant activists side is. Shame you can't understand anything they're singing about, eh? Oh no, you can. There's, um, for example, a living, breathing piece of defecating meat. That's the name of your song, and that's the chorus. It's beautiful. <laughs> so uh, on Facebook, true biblical Christians wonder if we're going to be able to find any hypocrisy in here. Um, made a meme. They made it. They made a little meme, and they took. Uh, you can see it on screen. They took a snippet of the album artwork for Monolith, the Monolith of Inhumanity. Monolith of Inhumanity. Just Monolith of Inhumanity, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. and they posted, uh, if evolution was real, the millions of years of raw meat would, would have given us predator teeth. Okay. Um, and they went with the text, Roman 120, for the, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. It's just like word salad. Uh, yeah, it's, it's like somebody's took a Scrabble board and threw it in the ground and like, let's just make words up and see what happens. So they are without excuse. Like, I had no idea. And even, also, Corinthians- even his eternal power and Godhead. Yeah. What? And uh, Corinthians 2.14, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know no neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Like again, it it just seems like word salad. To it's me. it's that thing that crazy like crazy religious fundamentalists do. They take things that make no sense, pick a couple of words and go, That's what that means. Yes, bingo. Like that could be interpreted in many, 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 many yeah. ways. For the invisible things of him Yeah. Of the creative oh, fuck it. So Thank Travis you. Ryan, who's Travis Ryan? Travis the front man. Cool. For a uh, cattle decapitation. Met him a few times. Fairly nice guy. I don't know him too well. Spoke more so to the drummer, uh, Dave McGraw, and the ex bassist, Derek. Both yeah. nice guys. Well, Travis Ryan took issue with this meme. Yeah, he's quite active online. Yeah. And I'm a fan. Travis, I, I am a, I'm a fan of this. Um, so Travis hit back at them. Hi, I'm Travis. I'm the one who commissioned that art piece that you stole for your dissemination of your little fairy tale. It's by the artist Wes Ben Scooter, or Ben Scotter. It seems, per usual, you people cannot follow your own Bible. Remember, thou shalt not steal. You can't even get that one right. You are garbage. Your religion is on the top of the garbage heap of organised world religions, similar to that monolith uh, there which represents the ills of humanity. That's you, not your man-made... Uh, no, sorry, that's, that's, that's your man-made nonsense. You are thieves. You are garbage. You will always be garbage remember that and then he's just posted a little image of the bible with thou shalt not steal highlighted and red <laughs> yeah that's uh that's that's funny that's good i think that's not only art is sticking up for art itself but also making sure that people aren't decontextualizing art or misunderstanding or using it for their own appropriate or inappropriate games which is fair having said that you know um we just talked about uh, interpretation uh, being very important and mm-hmm. context also very important. Always. Um, and intent, yeah. very important as well. Jesus and God never talked about um, never talked about copyright violation. That's uh, no, but they don't, they don't speak about theft. That's a, that's a man-made law. But we've decided that that's theft. We've decided that taking someone's image is theft. Obviously, I agree with it, but mm-hmm. they can just make the argument that now nah, Jesus would have been all right with. Uh, well, I mean, like, I think if that's the route we're going to go down, then this full conversation is futile because everything except suicide is completely <sighs> irrelevant. As soon as you repent, how can you say true? that? Haven't... How can you say how can you say that any conversation about religion and trying to make people see sense is futile? Mike? No, no, no. <laughs> you misunderstood me. I mean that the the justification of actions is futile because every sin is forgivable except suicide. In the Bible, you can do anything you fucking want, and as soon as you get to the gates, you go. Then you really mean it. I'm sorry. You're good. It's that Simpsons. Morning, morning. The Simpsons thing. 
lead the life that you want and then pray like hell on your deathbed. That caused offence at the time. When I can imagine, eh? Film. What's that? People like getting upset. I was also going to mention the uh, the Satanists' uh, erection of a, uh, the Bahamut, Baphomet statue mm-hmm. outside of some, some place um, in America. Yeah. Uh, poking or taking issue with the fact that we're supposed to have a separation of church and state and you can't have a, a statue of the Ten Commandments outside government buildings. Um, people have obviously been taking issue with that, but I didn't really see how it related to music other than, you know, metal. And yeah, I don't think there's too much to read into it that way. I think it's basically just people making a point, but not really. Well, there are further stories with it. Uh, not, not not strictly relating to that, but mm-hmm. um, Blink-182's guitar player that isn't Tom, because he left, apparently. The world changes. I miss you. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. It's really bad. Yeah, it seems that, <laughs> it seems they've gone from where one mad loser that, that's obsessed with alien conspiracy theories to... Uh, uh, They're not mad, conspiracy mad, theories. Yeah, These uh, are real conspiracy life facts. Ex- experiences. Careful, you'll get us thrown off of the internet. I'm not having you Alex Jones us. <laughs> so, um Turn the freaking frogs gay. That was a good impression. That was all right, yeah. Um, Matt Skiba, I believe his name is, um, just talking about how he's a proud card-holding member of the Church of Satan. And then when pushed on that, like, why? Like, he talked about how I'm really into black magic to a degree, and I, I buy into all of that stuff. Mm-hmm. Not really what the Church of Satan's about. Um, no, I thought the eight tenets of Satanism were pretty much about living a good life. Exactly. Um, <laughs> which is a common misconception about Satanism. Yeah. And- what he went with was... Really, I'm just into all the imagery. It's like, motherfucker, you don't need to pay 300 bucks to be a member of the Church of Satan to buy black clothes. Yeah. <laughs> you, you get you them can anywhere. Wear, you can wear a pentagram anywhere you want. Exactly. So, um, yeah, I thought that was I thought that was funny. So, Travis Ryan, thank you for giving me my laughs of the week. That was, um, yeah. Keep, keep, keep laying it down to them. Repent, Jesus is coming. <laughs> get a towel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, all right, so let's talk about some titties. Oh, I fucking love titties. Love titties. We teased this in the intro. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, uh, I'm not going to be. Well, no, very fortunately, I'm not going to be taking my shirt off. Uh, Mike's going to be taking right. his off. <laughs> you won't see titties. You'll just see here. Okay. Those aren't the titties we're going to talk about anyway. I mean, that what we're going to put on the screen, you can see, is probably going to be not safe for work porn anyway, but not quite what you're expecting. As it turns out, Aristides have a few uh, new options for the way they're manufacturing their guitars. Um, Levi's only told me a little bit briefly about it, so I'll let him inform you. Um, yeah. So this is the, uh, what do they call this? The, the R series. R series. So those familiar with Aristides... Uh, R's and titties. <laughs> <laughs> their guitars aren't oh. made of wood, are they? No. Uh, and they go they're through this... Injection mould plastic. Yeah. Or whatever kind of material they use but they're injection molded yeah they're really popular aren't they um everyone they're cool, them. Man. they are cool guitars they're really interesting it's like is it not like um aerospace grade materials so like it, it, they're fairly futuristic it's a cool concept it's a guitar that should in theory never really need any tweak because it's just solid it is what it is it doesn't decay it doesn't have to move it just is as it is and they're obviously very, very well manufactured. Like the engineering behind them must be fucking ridiculous. Yeah, I've never seen anyone buy an Aristides and go, "I don't like this." No, uh, I've not. Everyone you see holding one, whether it's theirs or someone else's, looks fucking happy. Yeah, and they're cool guitars. Yeah, not my, not particularly my cup of tea. Um, but I, mean, I do like are. to see what they're. I, I like seeing what they're up to. You and know what actually, I do like about them? Go on. I think they take over Kiesel in terms of crazy finishes, but they still look really good. Because I think Kiesel have got a a habit of making over the top finishes that just too much aye like it's just just too much but have you even seen like like that it's like a white pearl um rainbow sparkle I, I don't know how to describe it that's the only way i could really give you an idea of the image of it like an rstd's finish and it's beautiful it's like so encapsulating sorry continue yeah. so we're talking about the arse yeah yeah a bit, a bit of the old arse and titties. so um <laughs> Yeah, so this new model, um, the the material has actually died in the, in the molding process, so it doesn't need to be painted after the fact. Um, and Kyle talks about this uh, giving you a different a different feel to the instrument, different level of sustain, uh, and they're lower priced than the normal model with a shorter build time, and they actually come stock with the Fishman uh, Fluence pickups with the battery pack. So yeah, um, cool, interested. As you pointed out, the fact that they are dyed in the moulding 
process mm -hmm. would suggest that these aren't going to discolor or anything like that because the, the it is that color all the way through and if they do it'll be really interesting because it should happen uniformly mm -hmm. and as you pointed out that should then potentially change the characteristics of the guitar as well because it'll probably change the density of the material to some degree you might find that different paints have different effects in terms of like tone like that'd be fucking insane yeah um if that is the case, I mean, that's obviously speculation, but very interesting things to, to observe. I asked Kyle about it, and mm -hmm. um, he said the current build time for an Aristides is about seven months, mm -hmm. um, and these are looking at four months. Potentially less as well. Yeah, um, going down to between two and four months once the processes are uh, sorted out. And they're about 300 euros cheaper than the standard model. And when I say the standard model, the standard model comes stock with Seymour Duncans, and this comes stock with the Fishman Fluence pickups. So I think the Fishman Fluence, Fluent, Fluence, not Fluence, mm -hmm. Fishman Fluence would probably be another 200 euros on top of the standard price. Yeah, so you're getting more for less. Yeah, so all in, you're probably, you know, if you spec a similar guitar with those pickups, you're probably saving about 500 euros on this, which is, um, yeah, I'm, I'm all for that. Good. I, I like. I really like it when companies try new things. Yeah, I was just going to say, innovation is definitely a cool thing. Uh, especially when it's to kind of help meet demand. Mm -hmm. Oh, I like it. Necessity is the mother of all invention, as they say. Like, yeah. There's no point in inventing things or trying to come up with works for things that people don't need or want. This is obviously, like... I don't want to say a niche because I don't want to put them into like, some sort of pigeonhole that they don't deserve because they're, they're still very uh, well-known and functioning guitars. But there's not a lot of companies that aren't just going traditional route of wood and paint, frets, electrics, fucking hardware, and that's it. Like they're at least going, well, why not try like moulding them? Mm -hmm. I mean, you got a couple of companies that do like the carbon fibre guitars, like those. Uh, I can't remember the Irish company that do the carbon fibre acoustics. I know what you mean. They're moulded. Um, Don't they make Malmsteen one? I'm they sure Malmsteen they might have done. Yeah. Um, and then you've got like the other end of the spectrum, it's like ethereal guitars that use metal and like glow in the dark resin and just like they do suit demand they yeah. might not be everyone's cup i think aristides actually doesn't really fit in that same niche which is why i made that uh, distinction before because i think they appeal to just about every kind of guitar player that thinks i like guitars there's always something that's like oh they're fucking cool you know what i'd be really interested to see tell me a collaboration between uh, tiddies and strandberg because i think both of the those are two companies that are happy to throw out the, the traditional mold mm -hmm. and try something totally different. Yeah. So I'd be really interested to see what Ola England's, um, Ola, sorry, Ola Strandberg's, um, I'm so used to saying Ola England now. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'd be really interested to, to know what Ola Strandberg's thoughts are on this as a material because when he obviously decided to redesign the guitar from the ground up, mm -hmm. um, and he, yeah, he, he totally did that. I, I'm interested to know if he considered move, going for a material that wasn't wood or if he was just working purely from a, an ergonomic perspective because mm -hmm. uh, he's not a guitar player himself, is he? So he probably wasn't thinking too much about the tonal implications. And well, I think that's probably what's most interesting about both of those companies and why your partnership's a good idea or, or could be very interesting because it seems to be that they're not coming at the building a guitar from like a luthier or personal vested interest. It's like an engineering feat. Mm -hmm. It's like how do we improve something that necessarily isn't bad but could be different or maybe even by accident we find that it's actually better it's cool that's yeah. that's cool it's interesting um cool let's finish up with some album club then yeah let's fucking do it so you want to go first california it was mr bungle yeah <laughs> i didn't hate it i didn't hate it at all uh, my it, wife hated it it's not hateable it's just yeah. really hard to listen to at times I don't even know if I'd say that. It just no? it, it put me in a... It's kind of like the um, uh, Incubus album in okay. that it, it put me in a place. Mm -hmm. Imagery in my mind. Right. Um, whereas Incubus kind of took me to a time in my life that I didn't care to have too much memory of. Mm -hmm. This, it sounded like a soundtrack to like an old Nickelodeon cartoon. It's funny you say that because I think of like Rocco's Modern World. Yeah. Or like the Angry Beavers or something crazy like that. When you think of that, Cat Dog. Yeah, exactly. Or all those Arnold. weird fucking cartoons. And I think it's all the sound effects and the, like the not impossible to find, but not commonly used instruments that they put in there. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, you mentioned, you said, uh, you know, the songs on here you'll know, like Pink Cigarette, mm-hmm. which uh, I didn't, but didn't Retro Vertigo. Yeah, yeah. I'm convinced that was in a film. Absolutely fucking convinced it probably that was, was in a film. But I can't find any, like, as soon as it started playing, I was like, I know this song. And then the chorus hit, I was like, I definitely know this song. You've probably seen the the video for it. We spoke about that before as well. I don't know if you've watched it or not. I've but not. The official video, as far as I understand, came from a group of people who were just enthusiasts of the band, made a fucking insane video. And I think the band liked it that much. They just adopted oh, okay. it as the official video. At least that's how it looks online, because when you look it up, that's the video that always comes up. Right. But it's cool. It's cool. really interesting. We're getting towards that territory now where we're going to have had 10 Album Club episodes. So we're, I'm going to get to put all of your albums that you've given me in order. This certainly won't mm. be at the bottom. It's not It's not the worst. No. But um, yeah, not not my favourite. Um, just came across as very like artistic. Um, but... but Artistic, autistic, I can't decide. Somewhere in that, like... It's definitely sitting on the fine line of genius and madness. Yeah. It definitely is, because there's so much cool content in it, but it's like almost like they've, they've just dropped everything on top of each other. Yeah. Like, I love it. I think it's really... like It took me a long time to enjoy it, if I'm honest, but I really, really I like it now. And I can understand what you're saying about it. Like, it just... I don't hate it, but do I really like going to listen to it? I think you know what um, I think if I was going to sit in the house and do a load of drugs <laughs> which isn't something I do um, I, that that would be the, the, the album I think that would be asking for trouble Acid and that album no I'd go for that I think you'd be asking for fucking trouble there's too much madness in it I mean saying that's not even the most in, like insane Mr. Bungle album um, what's the one after that it's like Slowly Grown Deaf or something it's called it's got like a, a clown's face, I'm sure, for the album cover. I know, I know the album cover. Yeah, that's yeah. fucking even even worse. That's like haunted circus music. Anyway, sorry, I'm yeah. talking about your album that you had. Oh, well, so, um, what have you got for me this this week? I'm going to do it this way. Okay, that's fine. So, your next album to listen to is Isan, After, which I know you enjoyed Leprous. You yep. also like Devon Towns and stuff like that in between. Um, in between The Buried Me. This album's a really, really well-produced album. It's got some strange bits in it but there's a lot of dynamic range there's a lot of really nice beautiful clean guitars and fretless bass and saxophone and whatever else and then it there's bits when it's fucking thundering crazy weird chromatic guitar runs and eight string guitars but like bits where it's just it's it's a diverse album it's really really good that way and i think it's quite emotive as well some of the songs on it are fantastic um frozen lakes on mars undercurrent um Barren Lands is the intro track. What I like about it is like the same reason why I quite like Leprous. It's, there's like a hook in almost every song that you'll probably catch on to. And if you listen to the album, you'll be like, the next track comes on, there'll be a bit in the song that you're looking forward to. So it makes you listen to the full album, okay. which is quite cool. Yeah. Um, and as far as I'm aware, I might be wrong, it was actually Leprous that performed on the album. Right. And the idea being they were a Sans backing band. Okay. So... That's yours. I've not oh, listened to totally that. So one more time, that is... Isan, After. After. Cool. Cool. And I had Casey Roberts in the Life Revolution. Bit of a, yeah, an easy one because you know the album. You, yeah. yeah. I actually prepared some notes. Oh, really? Yeah. Look at so that. This was on one of the days where I wasn't run off my feet and had lots to do. So uh, my criticisms were... First of all, I'm jealous I'm not in his band or on his level. <laughs> Second of all... The first track is too beautiful and chilled out as a soul ballad, leaving me wanting more and disappointed almost that there's not a full album of just that kind of style right. of music. Yeah. Because it, it leads you into something you're not expecting, yep. but in such a good way. Um, the production is just too good. The snare might be my favourite non-death metal pingy snare. And I think that's something that death metal, especially brutal death metal bands, plagiarise from like hip-hop and soul bands is that really well-produced drum kit sound, or it should be at least... And not not even in terms of like well produced as in on the album it's like mega poppy but a snare that just fucking cuts and there's a lot of character to it for me at least um, chord choices are too much better than everyone else as that's the way I've wrote it and I've wrote Sting Stevie Wonder Stephen Wilson Hans Zimmer John Williams Jacob Collier Prince Corey Henry Herbie Hancock Alan Holdsworth all in one fucking man or band 
Uh, too involving, it's dynamic, it's unpredictable but not fatiguing, it's musical, it's technical, it's enjoyable, soulful and natural. The instrumentation is too well choreographed, everything has its place, order and purpose, and that he can rap and sing, uh, which ruined new metal for me by being able to blend these things in a non forced non cringy entertaining fashion. So, aye, that was my criticism. Yeah. That's that's the negatives I take. I have a criticism uh, of it, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I was, I would have just not mentioned this, right? You oh. know this criticism. Um, Do it. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna mention it because I've got a feeling that Casey will probably watch this. Um, Casey, when you write a song as good as Electric Lovers, <laughs> right? When you write a song as good as that song, and with with such a, a euphoric chorus with all of those rich vocal harmonies right and it builds the song builds and hits the chorus and then it goes off and does its thing Mm -hmm. goes into like an interlude and then it works its way back and gets to the chorus again play the chorus twice this is levi's fucking play the chorus when it's that good give me a double chorus Ah, it's almost like your pet hate and it's like this is the thing that the music industry has taught everyone they need but they're right. Yeah, there's a reason a double chorus is popular, right? That chorus is too fucking good to only appear twice in the song. <laughs> I think that song is too good not to appear twice on the album, personally. <laughs> I I really enjoy that song, and the thing I enjoy most about that song is you can take that song and Oh We Are Young, or or is it just called Fire or Fire Burning? Mm-hmm. Fire, just to- fire Burning. They are totally different. Oh, I s- totally different songs. Uh, or like, um, is it Jet Plane? Airplane? Yeah, Jet Plane. Jet Plane. Like, there's so much variance on that album yeah. it's fucking incredible sorry we got the song titles wrong Casey my yeah, apologies totally but the like, it's the iTunes generation yeah but you know what I, th- I think albums that I really enjoy I find I don't remember song names because I just put the album on yeah. I don't worry about going like track 3 track yeah. 4 of that one's really good you just listen to the album Yeah. and that is by all accounts one of those albums that just catches you man like it's yeah. unbelievable so there you fucking go silly thank you Casey for the music that you make absolutely um, keep making it uh, yeah and if you if anyone else listened to it and enjoyed that do go and check out all of their other stuff they have had an album out come come out since then uh, is Live from the North an actual live album is it Hamilton Hustle the al- name of the album I forget it's got the song Try Beneath the Storm on it though um, which is actually probably my favourite song because of the end section of the tune is just excellent I think the, 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 the real point here should just be that everyone should just go and fucking check the band out yeah if you haven't, you are missing out musically as a person. So, what am I giving you this week? I don't know. It's probably going to be a punishment exercise, knowing you. No, it's not. Um, oh, good. I'm going down. I'm the, only kidding. I'm going down the same route of giving you something that you've probably heard. In fact, I know you've heard it. Um, only because I just saw it. I went into my iTunes with the intention of finding an album for you, and it was right there in my face. This is where you you're talking is. about the double chorus, isn't it? Um, yeah. Ha yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ha! Fucking called it. Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> Act, the band Act, A C T. Swedish. Uh, I yeah, believe so. Um, just more evidence of that fact that all of the best bands in the world are from Sweden. When it comes to melody and chord progressions, you're absolutely right, and they all come from ABBA. Everything, yeah. everything came from ABBA. It, all music came from ABBA. They are the. You call it what you want, but that's the fucking truth. We should really go back to uh, what were they called? True biblical Christians and their creationist myths. Um, Actually, maybe there's some truth in that. Everything came from Abba. That is, ah, ah. Abba is the the true creator. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. And the act album that I'm going to give you is uh, Last Epic. Mm-hmm. They've had a ton of ton of great albums, but Last Ep- Epic will always be the winner for me because it's a concept album, and I love a good concept album. Circus Pandemonium is also a concept album, um, but I don't enjoy it nearly as much as Last Epic. Last Epic is an epic of an album and again it has a song on there i'm not going to name the song because i want everyone to listen to the album from start to finish i don't want you to jump yeah to it but when you get to it it is the perfect chorus it's like when i say perfect i mean a computer could have written it using a formula it's that perfectly composed the bass line the harmonies everything about it is just you as soon as it starts happening you know you could pause the song and write exactly where it's going to go and it does exactly what you need it to do what you want it to do and i think that's important in songwriting giving the listener what they want and what they expect it's cool to to go off on tangents and Mm -hmm. surprise people but there's something really special about 
giving someone that feeling of being involved, giving them the yeah. thing that they're expecting. It happens and there is that feeling of warmth, like this just feels right. Yeah, it's, it's the, the basics of any music, even for people that don't really speak like music language, it's that returning home, it's having that, the resolve, that's, it, it, to even use the right terminology, it's the resolution, it's that beautiful feeling of you're home, you've arrived, everything's yeah. right. So Act, Last Epic, there are tons of great tracks on there. Like I say, listen to the entire thing, but uh, you know, they've, I mean, Mr. Landlord is a very cheesy, like campy tune, um, which is cool. Um, Wailings of a Tall Building. Is it Wailings of a Tall, tall Building? I believe it's called. That's another um, one that I don't remember track. the song title. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> um, that has a really cool guitar solo in it. Um, Mr. Gumble is an instrumental tune that's very cool. And you've, of course, got The Effect, which is uh, a belter. It's just a, a cool album. And you know what really bugs me with, with concept albums? Mm-hmm. And I, I love concept albums. I hate it when concept albums happen and the band never talk about the concept. Right. They never give you a rundown. Like, okay. here's, here's the story we were telling because this one is very abstract, very abstract. Um, and I, I enjoyed for many years listening to this and trying to theorize what the what it was all about, what was happening, what the story was. Um, there's a great Reddit post that someone has done a breakdown of it and their interpretation of what's happening. Um, yeah, go and look at that, of course. But yeah, I'd be really interested to, to hear your thoughts on these things because I was getting all manner of like aliens living in the in the walls of the house and like the house <laughs> flying away like n- no idea what was happening but um i know what you mean like some of the vibes of the music can be a bit like that yeah and i don't know the name of the guitarist my apologies if, if there's any chance you're listening but fucking hell the guitar work in that album's yeah. class as well yeah, yeah i just saw actually they're uh right in the in the midst of recording for their new album so That's cool to, uh, yeah a new a new act album will be out at some point soon um uh, anyway Casey, if you're listening, you should check that album out if you haven't heard it. That seems like something you'd be into. I made the uh, Casey Roberts recommendation to Joey Landreth, actually. Oh, that's cool. Um, and said that, look, you're both Canadian. You should, um, you both write incredible music. You should hook up and uh, tour the Great White North. Um, who knows whether or not he'll, he'll and invite he'll you do over. That. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that would be a, yeah. That would be a love to see that. Um, anyway, cool. So that brings us to the end of uh, Guitar Souls episode number 14. Yes, indeedy. Uh, thanks again for tuning in. Uh, for those of you who are still with us, we do appreciate it. Uh, this is not a labour of any matter of means. It's all about love. We really do enjoy it. Um, as always, please like, share, subscribe. Fucking tell your enemies, tell your friends, spray paint stuff like pictures of Levi on the wall. I probably don't do that. Um, but genuinely, if there's anything you want, to ask us or content you think would be good or things you don't like please don't hesitate to get in contact like the facebook get yourself on soundcloud pff, send levi some money just whatever's good for triple clarification don't go and spray paint my face on things that would be considered hate speech why i don't know you're not that ugly <laughs> thanks buddy i think uh, you're quite handsome that was, that was a compliment what my richard spencer haircut uh, don't don't mention him what were we what were we gonna the fret no state don't please <laughs> guitar souls fret no state it's coming wait wait a wee minute right you you were trying to say to me that we can't talk about things because alex jones get banned off the internet and you want to hit out with fucking richard spencer alt right partner come on <laughs> come on but everybody's alt right mike don't you know this everybody sure. is alt right that's just, Nazi. That, yeah that's just how that happens um i bought a pussy metal therefore according to uh what was her face that means means i'm a trump supporting racist um this is what happens i mean i don't really care about the controversy but i did watch the video of satchel playing it and it sounds fucking great yeah yeah i'm looking forward to giving that one a go anyway until next time bye fuckers